Good afternoon and thank you all for being here for the first press conference of 2021. Uh, based on things happening around the country today, we're off to a pretty bad start, but I'm confident that overall 2021 is going to be a much better year for our country and for our state. Um, it is certainly sad and tragic, uh, regrettable what's happening in Washington right now, and I hope all leaders of both parties will call for uh, calm and uh, there won't be any more injuries to people and damage to property um, or any damage to the core institutions of democracy that we have here in this country. I do want to start uh, by congratulating Devonta Smith and a meet native, won the Heisman Trophy last night. And I've been assured by everyone in my hometown that it's a bigger deal for them to have a Heisman winner than a two-term governor. But Amy is certainly on the map. And I do want to congratulate not just him, but, but his family. Uh, his mother, uh, Christina, is actually a supervisor in the Tangible Parish Office of DCFS. Uh, and she's been a, a, a tremendous asset to the state of Louisiana for a long time. And I also congratulate his father, Kelvin, as well. You should know that today I signed two executive orders um, to call for special elections for Congressional District 2 and Congressional District 5. The vacancy was created at Congressional District 2 by the resignation of Congressman Richmond. I received his letter yesterday, and obviously the vacancy uh, in Congressional District 5 was created by the untimely and tragic death of Congressman-elect Luke Letlow on December the 29th. Uh, the qualifying for those offices, uh, those elections, I should say, uh, will take place January 20th through 22nd. The primary election will be in March, and the general election will be in April. Later today, I will sign a letter uh, that we will send to the Secretary of State given my formal approval of the emergency election plan that he submitted uh, to me and to uh, the legislature previously, which in all material respects is uh, very much consistent with the elections that we held previously, with the exception of not having extended uh, days of early voting. Um, and given the lower turnout uh, election that we would expect um, in these uh, March and April elections, I think that that's uh, appropriate. I am joined today as usual by Dr. Joe Canner, who as an emergency room physician did receive his second dose of the Pfizer vaccine uh, this week. Uh, he will be speaking about vaccines uh, a little bit later to you in this press conference um, and, and what has happened this week since we expanded the eligibility, uh, eligible priority groups uh, for this week. That decision was made last week based upon the allocation once we got it on Tuesday for the vaccines that we would receive this week. Uh, and we saw an opportunity to do that expansion. And of course, we did it during a holiday week uh, and, and uh, so forth, uh, but overall very successful. Uh, and it indicates the positive movement we have uh, to make more uh, vaccine available to more people in more places uh, as we uh, move forward in time. And certainly we're trying to get the infrastructure right so that we can just dial it up uh, over time uh, and make sure that more people are being vaccinated. Uh, I do know that vaccine is the hot topic this week, um, and I want to tell you that, that we are gratified thus, thus far on the demand that we're seeing uh, for vaccine, um, and, and it appears uh, that in uh, settings all across the state and really all across the country, uh, there is growing demand for it. There's reduced vaccine hesitancy um, out there. Uh, and I think that that's warranted because the vaccine is safe, it is effective. We're not gonna put this pandemic behind us in this state, in this country, or really uh, anywhere in the world until enough of our population is vaccinated. Um, but before we get to the vaccine, I wanna talk about the COVID numbers, which quite frankly are not good. It's, it is distressing. Uh, to say the least. Um, we are again at record highs today um, in terms of the daily case count uh, that we're reporting, 6,882 new cases of COVID-19 uh, in the state of Louisiana. Again, that's the highest number of daily cases that we've reported at any point in the pandemic. 
Um, and uh, it's also uh, troubling because that's um, on 36,873 tests. Uh, so somewhere around 18% of our tests last week that we are reporting on today came back positive. What that tells you is beyond any doubt, we have tremendous amounts of COVID in our community. Community spread um, is, is a real issue uh, right now in the state of Louisiana. Um, sadly, we're reporting 46 new deaths uh, today as well for a total of 7,681. Uh, COVID-19 deaths uh, since the start of the pandemic. Another record we're reporting today is we actually have one more person in the hospital today than we did uh, at our previous peak during the pandemic, which happened during the March-April time period, that, that first real surge, we had 1,992 COVID inpatients uh, across the state of Louisiana. Again, that's 1,993 today. Um, 207 of those patients are on mechanical ventilators. And so I guess I can sum this up to tell you that we are very much on a trajectory right now of increased positivity, increased cases, increased hospitalizations that threaten our ability to deliver life-saving care in our hospitals. Now, we are not uh, imminent in terms of uh, resorting to crisis care. Um, but clearly, if we stay on this trajectory over time, um, that will happen. And, and so uh, I hope, I pray, I appeal to the people of Louisiana uh, to take stock of where we are. And it's not materially different than other states. Um, and do what is necessary. Do, do what is necessary. Do, do what... Um, well, we have to, um, and quite frankly, do what we know what works, and, and that is uh, engage in those mitigation measures religiously. Mask, distance, wash your hands, stay home when you're sick. I had an opportunity today, um, first thing this morning, to have a conference call, a uh, Zoom call, with about 20 hospital CEOs and medical directors across the state of Louisiana. Uh, they are all concerned about a number of things. They're working extremely hard. Um, and they're employing every means at their disposal to preserve the capacity in their hospitals and to um, treat people who are sick and prevent them from needing the hospital in the first place or to get them out of the hospital as soon as possible um, and, and to save their lives. Um, they're doing everything they can with the therapeutic treatments that they have available now that we didn't have to begin with. Uh, for example, remdesivir plus steroids in order to shorten hospital stays. Uh, we're using the um, convalescent plasma transfusions. Um, and then there is a robust engagement across the state now from our health care providers uh, to employ uh, increasing dosages that we're receiving over time of the monoclonal antibodies. Uh, treatments. These are infusions um, that if, if someone tests positive and very quickly after developing symptoms uh, receives these treatments, it makes it much, much less likely that they will have to be hospitalized. And our hospitals are reporting really good uh, results from this. And for the few that have been hospitalized, um, their cases appear to be less acute than they otherwise would have been. Um, and so these are some things that, that, that are actually positive out there, but overall, we're in a very, very difficult place. And one of the things that make this particularly challenging is the non-COVID patient census in our hospitals is much higher, much, much higher than it has been at any point during the pandemic. And so we're, we're stressing our capacity, both as it relates to beds in some places, but as it relates to staff everywhere. And one of the things that compounds this stress on staffing is the community spread that is sending people into the hospital is also causing doctors and nurses and therapists to be unavailable to work because they have COVID themselves. So we, we are in a very difficult place and, and it doesn't do any good to sugarcoat it, to pretend um, that it's not real. I assure you this, this is real. There's more COVID in our state right now than ever before. 
And we have no reason to believe that we've seen the full impact of all of the Christmas-related travel and activities and gatherings. And then coming behind that are those associated with New Year's. We can't undo what was done yesterday. And so what we have to do is focus on what we can do today to make sure that as soon as it is possible, we get to a better place and we slow the transmission, flatten the curve, reduce that positivity uh, rate of our tests, slow the cases and, and reduce hospitalizations. We, we just have to do that. Um, and, and so again, I'm, I'm appealing to the people uh, of Louisiana um, to, even if you don't like them, and I suspect nobody really likes them, the mitigation measures we know work. They're the same ones recommended by the CDC and the Surgeon General and the White House Task Force and so forth. And quite frankly, they're not that damn onerous. Put a mask on. You owe it to your family. You owe it to the community. You owe it to those healthcare workers. Even if you're not concerned about yourself, and we do know that masks confer a benefit on the wearer as well. So let's all do better. Um, and you know, right now we're talking about vaccines as well, and that's incredibly important. Um, and that's something that should inspire in all of us a, a sense of hope. Um, but we should also be realistic about that. We are months away from having enough vaccine administered to make a dent in what is our current problem, and that is the surge of COVID-19. The mask remains the most effective tool we have at our disposal. It is not the vaccine. But we are gonna do everything we can to ramp up our vaccination program as quickly as possible, uh, working with the ACIP recommendations coming from CDC to establish our priority groups and to administer those injections as, as quickly uh, as, we, as we can and as, as efficiently uh, as we can. Um, I want it to be going faster than it is. I haven't talked to anybody in any state or, or I had a conversation with General Perna just yesterday um, about this as well. I mean, nobody is satisfied. Uh, this is just starting. It is a tremendously complex logistical uh, exercise, if that's the right word, and it will improve over time, much like uh, testing improved over time in terms of having more tests available, not just more tests, but tests of different types um, that some were easier to administer than others. And, and then all the testing uh, places uh, that, that came online over time. And this is gonna happen with the vaccinations too. And we're gonna try to make it happen just as quickly uh, as we possibly can. So we're taking the doses that we have and the population that we have eligible for the vaccines in accordance with the, the priority groups that we're working with them, and we're administering uh, those vaccines. Each week, um, and I think you know this already, we get just a few weeks, I'm sorry, a few days notice of what we're gonna get the following week. Uh, and then we have to refine our plan, place our order, um, and then those vaccines, if everything goes right, on Monday or Tuesday of the following week, arrive at the destinations uh, that we've ordered them for. And then in the, in the intervening time period, we're refining our plan, communicating with all of those entities that will be receiving and administering the vaccines uh, to make sure that they are ready, uh, make sure that they're taking the right number of appointments, that, that we're minimizing waste, because this vaccine, as far as I'm console, uh, concerned, we need to be treating it uh, like gold. Uh, and and th this is all a, a very involved process. I can tell you the people at the Department of Health are working extremely hard. Uh, we have a lot of really good partners out there in our hospitals and clinics and, and pharmacies um, and other places. Uh, and, and I can assure you this is gonna get better over time as well. As you know, those who are 70 and older are among those eligible to receive the vaccine now. Um, and that includes those who are 70 and older in our prisons. Uh, and we will be vaccinating them as well as uh, 
a uh, handful of prisoners who are at end stage uh, renal disease. Uh, and so as we open up priority groups for our general uh, population, we will vaccinate those same priority groups uh, who, are, who are actually in our, in our prisons. Um, uh, that vaccination of those inmates should start next week. Um, there, we know uh, how many we have. We're in the process of getting uh, consents uh, and that sort of thing done now. I think there are 489 inmates who fall into that uh, category. Uh, all but uh, 39 of them are housed in state institutions, uh, state facilities. Uh, 39 are housed at the local level. But we're going to make sure that we get to, to all of them. Uh, in accordance with the CDC and the LDH guidelines and our priorities, um, the Department of Corrections has already vaccinated 297 frontline medical staff who work at the prisoners, uh, I'm sorry, at the, at the state-run prisons. So this protects the staff who are critical to providing health care for inmates and who will actually be um, helping to administer these vaccines as well. So on that note, I'm going to ask Dr. Canner to come up and share with you all some information about um, the vaccines and the vaccination program. Uh, I would ask you if you have uh, questions about that, uh, direct those to Dr. Canner while he's up here. And then uh, on the back side of, of his presentation, uh, I'll come back and uh, deliver a few more prepared remarks and then take your questions. Thank you, Governor. Afternoon, everyone, and Happy New Year. Um, I'm going to start off just uh, before we talk about the vaccine, just to talk about where we are in a little bit more detail. Um, with the outbreak here. And, you know, I'll preface it by saying, um, as, as the governor said, there's a lot going on around the country today. And I'll, I'll share with you one of the things I've had to learn uh, as, a, as an emergency physician, uh, as an ER doc, is how to, in a very chaotic and noisy setting, focus on what really matters and what's going to save my patient's life. And, I'm going to ask the state of Louisiana to do that right now. There's a lot going on out there, and it's not just bad. We've got, like, the playoffs are starting. We've got the best team in the NFL, and there's a lot, a lot going on, on the good and the bad. And we need people to keep their eye on the ball right now because, as the governor said, there is more COVID circulating in this state at this point in time than there has been at any point in time in the pandemic. There is more COVID now than there has been at any point prior to date. And you see that not just in the cases that get reported every day, as in today where we reported the largest number of new cases to date, but we certainly see it in our hospital censuses, as the governor said, and unfortunately we see it in fatalities. And we've come to realize that deaths are really a lagging measure in this, uh, both when someone actually passes and also when that fatality gets reported to us. Um, it's a lagging measure. But just going back the past couple weeks, we've had new reported deaths every day between 40 and 60 a day. 46 today, 50, 48, 51, 60 the week prior. And um, you know, at some point, we need to recognize that that's unacceptable and it's going to get worse. As our cases are going up now, and as the governor said, continue to go up, what we know is that that fatality count will continue to go up, just lagging behind. And I don't think that's something that folks in Louisiana should accept. This virus does not spread unless we let it. It's spreading more now than it ever has before. And on the dawn of a new year, despite being in the middle of very chaotic and distracting times, that's what's important to us. And I'd like to ask folks to take recognition of that. If you look on the dashboard today, you'll see the map of community transmission risk, parish by parish, but you might not be able to make out each parish because it's all red. 64 parishes are in the highest community transmission risk according to the categorization that the CDC gives us. 
that has consequences. <laughs> people get hospitalized, people don't survive that. We have to turn it around and as the governor said, there's no indication yet that it's doing anything but continuing to go up here. So that's a broad, broad warning call to folks. Looking forward to um, you know, a little bit more um, happy or, or optimistic uh, items, let's talk a little bit about the, the vaccine. And, and I'll tell you, I continue to be encouraged every day since we have started to roll out the vaccine at what I see. As the governor said, the degree of vaccine confidence in Louisiana is very high. And on one hand, demand far exceeds supply right now. On the other hand, it's not a bad problem to have. It's better than the opposite. We're trying to get more vaccine from the feds. You know, we advocate for it every time that we have communications with our partners in Operation Warp Speed. But at the end of the day, I am encouraged that people in Louisiana want to get this vaccine. And for all the right reasons, this is a safe vaccine, this is an efficacious vaccine. And it, it should tell you something when doctors, nurses, medical school pro professors, when they're clamoring to get it, that should tell you this is a good vaccine to get. Um, I was fortunate to get my second dose of the Pfizer vaccine uh, yesterday. I got it um, at, at UMC in New Orleans uh, with a number of other colleagues of mine in the ER. And um, just like the first dose, it was, it was pretty emotional for the folks that were in the room there. Um, I feel pretty good. I, <laughs> my arm's a little bit sore. I felt a little bit crummy last night. Took some Tylenol this morning. And, and, and I feel good. I, I really want to encourage people, when it is your opportunity to get the vaccine, don't pass that up. Don't pass up your opportunity to do so. Um, the team is working really hard to make sure that every dose that comes into the state is made available. Knowing that, again, the, the demand is really lagging, uh, really surpassing the supply right now. A couple days ago, uh, we announced to hospitals across the state that they should begin to uh, offer vaccine to their communities. That is the process that is starting right now. I know a number of hospitals have started to offer that and more and more will in the coming weeks. This is primarily with the Pfizer vaccine because hospitals have what they need to store and manage that scene appropriately. And that's a really encouraging part of this as well. So what you're gonna see from, uh, from the state and from the Department of Health is every effort made to make sure that there's no vaccine on the shelf and that it's pushed out as quickly as possible to somebody that can provide that vaccine to folks that need it. And again, that, that's gonna pick up um, week by week. I'll let you know what we're gonna expect to come into the state next week. And um, it's essentially the same numbers that we had this past week, which I understand is what every state is, is getting right now. So for next week's allocation, we are expecting 28,275 doses of Pfizer, uh, 27,500 doses of Moderna, of which 18,700 will be diverted towards the CVS and Walgreens long-term care partnership program, leaving uh, 8,800 doses um, for allocation within the state. Um, if you total that up at the end of next week, that'll give us 293,525 total doses allocated on a broad sense to Louisiana, of which 93,500 would have been diverted towards the long-term care partnership program. Um, I do want to mention in, in, in more unfortunate news, um, w we had some reports come in this past week of vaccine loss. And, and I'll tell you, it's um, a little bit of me dies every time that we hear about a dose that's, that's been lost because I know how important these doses are. And it really does, does, does get at me. So it was difficult to receive this news. We've had a total of 146 doses lost so far um, in, in Louisiana. The, the bulk of that, I'll, I'll just let folks know, was 120 doses that were stored in a refrigerator, um, a provider's refrigerator over the weekend, this past weekend in the Baton Rouge area. And uh, because of the weather events, there was a power outage and it wasn't recognized until folks came back into the office. And so 120 doses of, of Moderna lapsed their temperature window and it was really, really unfortunate to receive that news. Um, we'll update you on that number, you know, periodically as, as it comes in. Um, 
Taking a step back, I, I, I do want to mention this, and, and um, the governor said it very well. The vaccine is, is, is important because that's, that's how we get out of this. But in the immediate term, the vaccine is not how we stop the spread right now. We're nowhere close to the amount of vaccine coverage necessary to make a public health impact, make a very big impact on individuals. To make a public health impact, you have to have much more coverage than we have right now. And when we talk about not being distracted, the vaccine work is important, essential, but right now, in order to stop having to report 40 or 50 or 60 lives being lost a day, that's mitigation measures. That's the only thing that's gonna affect that. It's masking, it's distancing, it's washing your hands, it's staying home when you don't have to be out, finding ways to do your activities virtually, both socially and professionally. That's what we need right now, and I can't stress that enough. The vaccine is important to get out of this thing long term, but right now it's the mitigation measures that are really important. And you know, we, we've had every every showing that this is this is important. And I'm cognizant of, of the very tragic loss of Congressman Elect Letlow and 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 and, and how a young, healthy individual is leaving behind a, a, a wife and, and two young kids, and, and incredibly tragic. And, and, and yet there's many, many more tragedies like that in Louisiana from COVID that just are a little bit less well known. So, um, you know, as we go into this new year, I really would ask people to be cognizant of that. And, and we think it's gonna get worse before it gets better because we haven't, we haven't peaked yet. So this is the most dangerous time of the pandemic for us is, is right now and we haven't even peaked. So please, please take that to heart and think long and hard about what activities you're gonna do for yourself or your family. As the governor said, what happened over Christmas and New Year's is in the past at this point. So let's take the opportunity in the new year to double down and, and, try, and try and stop the spread. Be happy to answer a few questions if there are. Sam, we missed you last, last press conference. Yeah, uh, Dr. Skinner, uh, you said 8,800 doses uh, will be available for the state of Moderna next week. Are all those, or how many of those are going to pharmacies? And also, who are the providers that lost the uh, doses of vaccine? Follow up with you afterwards about, uh, about the, the names of the providers. Um, for the Moderna doses, so there's 8,800 that's coming in new. We're gonna combine that with some amount that we have to allocate with, uh, from our stores in Morrison-Dixon. And uh, the, the ballpark number of that is somewhere between 10 and 15,000. Don't have the exact number yet. We've changed a little bit about how we're running the supply um, in an effort to really make sure that no vaccine sits on itself. During the first couple weeks of vaccine allocation, um, as clinics or, or, or some of the tier two hospitals were set to receive some of the Moderna, they had asked the department hold on to some of their supply to make sure that they had enough storage room and enough that they felt prepared to, to take it all. Um, and we offered that service. So some of Moderna was at the Morrison Dixon facility. We've changed that policy as of this week. So now th there will be no kind of supply on hold. So all that to say the 8,800 doses that we're getting new Moderna next week are gonna be combined with somewhere between 10 to 15,000 doses that you know, were at Morrison-Dixon. That will all be pushed out, divided largely between pharmacies and clinics. Won't have the specific list for you at, at the latest on Monday, we hope to have it earlier than that, but that's the bucket that's gonna to go to those two entities. We just communicated to vaccinating partners, to clinics, for example, that we would not be able to hold part of their allocation for subsequent shipments. And basically what we're gonna ship out now, we're gonna ship out whatever an entity can use that week or two coming up, and, and, and then they'll need to re-request to the department to get subsequent shipments. 
I think so. I mean, it, it was tough to predict how quickly it was going to be used, and I think a lot of um, providers, rightly so, wanted to take smaller allotments at first when they were still learning how to handle the vaccine. They're rightfully afraid of having any loss, and I think that was the appropriate move in the first couple of weeks. At this point, we've had some experience, so, so now the understanding is there is no you know, vaccine on hold, so to say. It, it is all, from this point forward, going to be pushed out immediately. Yes, sir? Between the 18,000-ish, 23,000, as those numbers added together, going to pharmacies and clinics next week, is that going to be the same list of 107 pharmacies or more going to be added, different list, kind of, yeah. where's that fall? The hope is that a lot more will be added. And I, th I think what we're going to try and do is, for any pharmacy that is enrolled as a provider, which is a process, and, and ready and willing and, and wants vaccine to give out, we're going to try to accommodate them before we go back and, and kind of resupply the ones that had it. I don't know yet how, how many it will be. But the, the intent is to increase the circle of pharmacies that have vaccine to, to, to give out. And it, it's pretty clear. I mean, at this point, I think pharmacies are a, and, and will continue to be a really effective way of moving vaccine out and making it available to the public, limited really only by supply. How much that, that we get is the real limiting factor. So the pharmacies that got it earlier this week expect to get it again or no? Not necessarily. Not, we hope to be able to, but that's far from an assurance right now. Yeah, yeah Melinda. Um, in terms of the, the vaccine numbers that y'all have so far, do you have any information about the percentage of those in the 1A category, the hospital workers, the EMS folks, and the, the long-term care folks who have been vaccinated so far? I mean, y'all had estimates on the numbers of people in that population, so do you have estimates on how many of them have actually gotten their first dose of vaccine so far? I don't, not yet. Okay, are y'all even trying to track that to determine how effective the rollout into these areas is? We are, you know, one of the things that we asked hospitals to do as they had some doses left over of the Pfizer after they put it out to their staff was to start and then make it available to community members. So it was actually a little bit difficult to go back and say how much was given to their staff versus some of those other categories. Um, you know, we certainly are tracking how much gets pushed out. In terms of the specific types of individuals that have received it, we don't have great data on that yet. Yep. Can we get any more information on what needs to happen before we get the kinds of mass vaccination programs involving the National Guard that we've been talking about in other press conferences? Like what's the timeline on that? What do we need to stand up this thing? Great question. It's more vaccine. Um, all, so th there's nine regional offices in the Office of Public Health, and all those nine regions have been working very hard the past three weeks to prepare um, community vaccination events, plans, you know, built on a lot of years of preparation and they do pod exercises and mass vaccination exercises every year, usually in conjunction with the flu vaccine. So they've been, those plans are essentially ready and they involve the National Guard and they're good plans. The challenge is we just don't have enough vaccine to do it with. And while supply is so limited, and you know, for example, we were able to supply 107 pharmacies with 100 doses apiece, and those pharmacies got booked up you know, almost overnight. Um, that's the real limiting factor now. Once we have enough vaccine made available to us to make those type of events practical, that, they'll happen. Is there any plan to have a sort of centralized clearinghouse for where to access a vaccine so that people in the 70 plus group aren't having to navigate the website and a bunch of different pharmacies to actually figure out where to get a vaccine or where to sign up? I think it's going to continue to be a multitude of options. I mean, pharmacies are going to, from here at this point forward, continue to be an access point as will hospitals, as will the community vaccination events. Once those events get up and running and scheduled, absolutely, there'll be a way to communicate that. They're just not with the supply as it is, that's not at the point yet. Yep, Julie. Do you have any benchmarks about how many people in each priority group you want vaccinated? Like, do you want 70% of the people in 1A I want 100% of, of, of those groups, 
you know, vaccine. And I'll tell you, I know um, in talking to some of my colleagues in the hospital, I heard some people say, oh, just, you know, I'll wait a couple of weeks before I get my vaccine. And my message to them is you might not have <laughs> as good access to it in a couple of weeks as you do now. So we want 100%. What is our trigger to move to the next phase or tier, which really I think is, is the question, is not a certain percentage of people vaccinated. It's really what your supply versus demand is. So what the CDC has recommended on this is they've said, when you start to see your appointments go from 100% capacity, like they certainly are now at the pharmacies, down to 80% capacity, that's an indicator that it's time to move to the next, the next phase. Linda? I just want to clarify something um, you said um, to answer one of the questions earlier. So the pharmacies, the 107 pharmacies this week that got doses of vaccine are not necessarily guaranteed to get doses next week because my understanding is that some of those pharmacies have been making appointments like for next week and the following week under the assumption they would continue to get a supply. That's correct, the way that you said it, they're not necessarily guaranteed to get subsequent allocations. Because remember, there were um, 12 or 13 parishes that we weren't able to get vaccine to this week because there were no pharmacies in those parishes that had actually finished the enrollment process. So our first goal is to make sure that the distribution is equitable from a geographic and a racial ethnic standpoint. So what we're gonna try and do for the subsequent allocations is to make sure that we have enough coverage across the state. That's gonna be the first goal. Once we're able to achieve that, we're gonna try and resupply the pharmacies, but that's a subsequent goal. What's your advice to some of these elderly people who are 400 people down on a wait list that a pharmacy got it this week and they think they're in line to get it, but now you're saying their pharmacy might not get vaccine next week. I, I, I hear it's, I think staying on the wait list is, is good. I think wait until the next round of allocations is made public and then continue to call and try and make an appointment. This will get better every week. Remember, this is just the first week, just the first round allocations. There'll be more and more pharmacies with vaccine and there'll be more and more hospitals that are offering vaccine to the community. So just the first week, the access will get better and I think appreciate folks' patience as we kind of get this rolling. Uh, one more and then I'll turn it back over to the governor. Yes, sir. So uh, there's, been, uh, there's been some criticism that the federal scheme for privatization is too convoluted and too complex. That it's making it unnecessarily complicating the logistics of actually getting it to people. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. I don't think it's complicating the logistics. I mean, I. I, I really feel now that the biggest limiting factor for us is how much vaccine is being made available to the state. I think you can take, you can have a discussion about what groups should have been prioritized that weren't and, and have that debate. At the end of the day, you know, there was an effort to push vaccine both to individuals that were involved in frontline care as well as individuals who are most likely to suffer health consequences, severe health consequences. It's an imperfect process. I think the CDC did a pretty good job. You know, we tried in Louisiana to take the best of that and that we did make some changes. We pushed it 75 years down to 70 years, particularly because we're trying really hard to keep people out of the hospital. I think it's, you can have that debate and discussion. I don't see that as a limiting factor in terms of logistics. I guess it's um, You know, at the end of the day, I, I think providers and vaccine and, for example, a, a pharmacist are going to do the best job that they can. Uh, pharmacists go through similar efforts when they give out any medicine, by the way. They don't, you know, they're in the business of giving the right medicine to the right patient. Um, as has been shown this week, that's not what's limiting us. You know, what's, what's limiting us is we just wish we had more vaccine to give to pharmacies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kenner. Um, I can tell you that we will have more uh, locations across the state that will receive the Moderna vaccine to be administered to individuals who are over 70 than we had this week. Um, it was a really good start. 
with 107 locations and 52 parishes uh, that we decided to do last Wednesday once we got Tuesday's allocation numbers. Um, and with the work that they're doing now, because we know next week's allocation numbers and we know what we can um, access uh, from the wholesale distributor, uh, there will be more sites. Um, and, and I have instructed uh, Secretary Phillips to make sure uh, that we are in all 64 parishes. Not necessarily with the pharmacist, with the pharmacy, I should say, but with a provider. It may be a clinic. Um, it may be a hospital, but there will be uh, some doses available for this priority group next week uh, in all 64 parishes. Uh, and if we can accomplish that and resupply every pharmacist who received it this week, then, then that's what's likely to happen. But we're working through all of that this week and, and we will make the announcement no later than Monday of next week and, and hopefully uh, sooner than that, so people will know uh, where the vaccine is going to be and where they can call and try to get an appointment. Um, and, and, you know, you, you can gather from the questions and the answers and what's happening across the country. There's nothing easy about uh, this process. But I will tell you, working in priority groups is absolutely essential uh, because we are trying to preserve hospital capacity and save lives. So it's important that the people receiving the vaccine the earliest in the process are those who are most likely to need a hospital bed if they contract the disease. And, and those are also the people most likely to die. And so they help us meet those objectives of minimizing uh, the number of hospital beds and staff that are required and, and, and making sure that we're saving uh, lives as well. Uh, so so we've, we've got a lot of work to do. I can tell you it is, it is nonstop. Uh, and, and I want to thank the folks at LDH who, who are working so hard. Um, we had an entire group of workers who didn't go home uh, this past weekend uh, for New Year's. Uh, and and uh, because they're working so hard uh, to make sure that, that we uh, are doing the best that we can to distribute and administer this time, uh, vaccine on a timely basis. I also wanted to share something um, with you that, that I gleaned from my call this morning with the, the medical directors of the hospitals. Um, as you can imagine, most of the people in the hospitals with COVID-19 are those who are older. Um, and, and they've been talking to these individuals to try to figure out where are you being exposed to the virus? Um, and, and what they said over and over to me on the phone this morning is that these older folks, by and large, who are in the hospital today, they're, they're getting exposed to the virus and they're contracting the disease because of informal gatherings at people's homes. And there's still this idea that if I go to my neighbor's house or my child's house or my brother's house or sister, whatever, if I know people well, then it must be safe. And, it, and it's just not. It's just not. And, and at the same time, those are the settings that, that are, I mean, we can issue all of the, the recommendations that we want. We can tell you what CDC is saying, what the White House Coronavirus Task Force, what the folks at the Office of Public Health are saying about all this. But at the end of the day, it is up to people to then act on all of that guidance. And, and we really have to do a better job. We have to do a better job. Um, and, and I will tell you that we will get to mass vaccination events uh, as soon as we have the vaccine on hand to stage such an event. We don't have it today. Um, and, and, and when we have the vaccine and it lines up with the priority group that's in, then being serviced, we're, we're gonna make sure that we are doing those events around the state uh, as we are able, uh, working with a variety of partners, not just the National Guard. Um, but for example, we may need to do that with Pfizer vaccine. If half the vaccine that we're gonna get going forward is Pfizer vaccine, uh, then we're gonna have to use it. And those ultra cold storage requirements will drive us to our hospital partners as being those people that we're gonna have to um, uh, partner with in order to have these mass vaccination 
events. So it won't just be the National Guard. And we are, we are right now uh, working through all of the planning necessary to actually uh, do these events. But we're not at the point where we can do them because we don't have the vaccine on hand. Uh, but when it is here, uh, we will be making those announcements and, and we will be doing mass vaccination of events where we're targeting people of, of whatever priority we happen to be on at that time. And I know there are a lot of questions. This is a big issue. Um, and, and there's no doubt uh, that we're making uh, mistakes. We're also learning and we're correcting and this is gonna be a never ending process and, and we're going to do better. But I urge the people of Louisiana to get vaccinated when you can, uh, to be patient and between now and then, and quite frankly, even after, wear your mask uh, and, and so forth. 2021 is gonna be better. How much better will depend on what we do and what we don't do, the decisions that we make. Uh, I wanna thank our healthcare workers, our pharmacists, our doctors, our nurses, everybody who is working so hard and has been working for so long uh, to deal with the pandemic and now to stand up a vaccination program. And I wanna thank all the people in Louisiana who have been responsible and who do take seriously uh, the guidance that comes from the CDC and the White House Task Force, the things that we've been talking about. And there are lots and lots of those people too. Um, and, and I really wanna thank them uh, because I know that, it, that it's not easy. And I know this is not the way we prefer to live. Um, but you, you do it anyway because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for your family, for your community, for your neighbor, inclu including your neighbors you don't even know. And it's also the right thing to do uh, with yourself. Okay, I am going to pause there and take some questions for a few minutes. I know we've already been here for about 50 minutes or so. Yes, sir. Governor, uh, it seems that the slow start we got was in large part due to hesitancy among people in phase 1A, particularly healthcare workers who didn't want to get the vaccine right away, creating kind of a demand issue. Uh, you know, and as we've seen, meanwhile, there were hundreds of thousands of 70-year-olds and up that they want the vaccine. In hindsight, do you think we should have switched that and started rolling out to 70-year-olds old, you know, sooner? And do you think, you know, is that lesson informed us going forward as we when to move to the next priority group? Well, every lesson informs what we do going forward. And, and if, if that's a lesson that we've learned that seems to have the application for, for what we're about to do, then, then obviously uh, we're taking that into consideration. Uh, I am not going to say that it was a mistake to accept the ASAP recommendations about who gets the vaccinations first. Um, and, and, I, and I will tell you that it is impossible for the people at the hospitals to know how many of their workers are going to avail themselves of the vaccine when it first becomes available, um, but they make orders based on their best guesses. They go, then go about getting consents and, and so forth. The good thing there is what we have seen over and over again is that the uh, vaccine hesitancy is diminishing over time. Uh, and as individuals get vaccinated of whether they're medical workers or anybody else, and, and their neighbors see that they got vaccinated and, and they didn't have a significant reaction or significant side effects and they know that it's safe, um, then they are saying, okay, I'm ready to get it too. Um, I, I think what you pointed out is just the function uh, of the fact that when you first start something like this, it isn't gonna be as smooth as you would want it to be, um, but it's, it's certainly getting better. Um, and, I, and I wanna thank all, all the folks who, who've worked so hard to get us to where we are today um, even at the same time when I'm saying I'm not pleased with where we are today and that's why we're gonna do better going forward. But there is not anybody out there uh, who, who doesn't want to do better and get more shots in people's arms, which is precisely why we're gonna minimize the number of vaccine that stays on the shelves at the wholesaler uh, waiting uh, for shipment uh, to, to, uh, to a, an entity that's then gonna administer them. If they're gonna sit on the shelf, we're gonna go send them out and that, that, that entity that, that uh, was, was asking the wholesaler to hold them, uh, they'll just get more out of the next week's allocation in order to satisfy uh, whatever it is that they have to do. Melinda? Uh, Governor, I'm sure you've seen this, this idea 
have been floated already, but um, have you thought of having someone who is sort of like, for lack of a better term, of the vaccine czar, like the person who is the logistics manager of their sole job is to track where the vaccines are going, make sure that facilities are using them in a timely fashion, and and sort of being able to adjust on the fly as needed. Is that something that is under consideration? Are you applying for the job? <laughs> no, not. <laughs> You know, we, we have a very good team, um, and, and I've been dealing with our team for a long time. Uh, whether it, uh, well, and, and I'm not going to start to call names because I, I would, I would um, uh, certainly leave some out. Uh, but but we've, we've got a, a good team. We developed a, a, a good plan. Um, and I was talking to General Perna, and this analogy may be lost on you all, but you know, he's, he's obviously a career soldier. I spent time in the Army. You do the very best job you can uh, to plan what it is you're going to do in battle. But there is no plan, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy because as soon as that happens, you are making adjustments. But the plan is absolutely essential to getting you started and to having a framework and starting the communication and the teamwork, and that's, that's where we are right now. Um, but I will tell you, um, uh, Secretary Phillips is personally involved in every aspect of this. Um, and and she, <laughs> she calls me and texts me about 100 times a day uh, about th different parts of this, and she's working with her team, and I am not uh, presently considering making any changes to our structure uh, o over the vaccination program. Yes, ma'am. So new tasks keep getting heaped upon the same people who already seem a little overworked in the Office of Public Health and the Health Department. So I guess I'm just wondering, are, are you looking at adding staff over there? I mean, it, how many different things can they be expected to handle before something just gets lost in that shuffle? Well, it's certainly if, if Secretary Phillips tells me that, that we need to do staff augmentation, and by the way, we do that on occasion now. Uh, we, we can bring in help, but sometimes there are things that need to be done in public health, and we have folks in the National Guard, for example, who, who can come in and help with those tasks. So we've been, we've been augmenting the staff there all along. Um, and, and if Secretary Phillips ever brings to me a recommendation uh, to do something like that, tr trust me, we, we will do it. Um, but I'm not going to get in front of her uh, at a press conference and say that we're about to do something that she hasn't even asked for. Julia? on the CDC guidelines. Who at the state level is making the decisions about what are different priority groups? I am. And I do it based on recommendations that come from ACIP. I do it based on recommendations that come from the Office of Public Health. Uh, I do it in consultation uh, with all sorts of people. Um, I don't think that there is an, a, a trade association in existence that hasn't sent me a letter telling me that their people uh, or essential frontline workers and need to be prioritized uh, for vaccines. So somebody has to make those decisions. Uh, I am making them. Um, and, and we're not, I'm not, we're certainly not trying to confuse anybody about those things. And we, we told you early on that we were gonna do everything we could to conform our plan to those ACIP recommendations because we know that those are experts uh, in the field. They're looking at this disease, these vaccines, uh, the current situation across the country and they're making recommendations and and by and large we have accepted those uh, the biggest deviation and one that I think we've explained and if we didn't I apologize they were saying started age 75 and above but when we looked at who's going to the hospital in Louisiana and who's dying in Louisiana the clear demarcation in terms of age was really 70 it wasn't 75 so this was a data driven decision recommended by OPH based on our state specific data uh, that and, and that was our goal we want to uh, preserve capacity at our hospitals and we want to save lives and so to do that in Louisiana we needed to start at 70 and not 75 now, that was the right decision to make. 
but there are about 485,000 more people in Louisiana who, who then satisfy that requirement. And I think that's a number that was in my head. I, I may be slightly wrong on the number, but that means that we have more work to do, but that still is the right order of priority uh, for us. Um, and then you're going to see essential frontline workers uh, initially in the healthcare arena. Uh, and then when we get past those, it will be other essential frontline workers that, that we will uh, vaccinate uh, as well. And all of whom believe, and all of whom are in good faith, that they ought to be first. Not everybody can be first. I mean, that's just, it's just not possible. And we don't have the number of, uh, of doses available to us to make that happen, assuming that, that we could somehow administer it all at once if, if we had it all available to us. So this is very much a process. And it's a process that, that we're doing everything we can to make sure that it works as best it can. And yes, we are going to learn uh, from, from certain strategies uh, that, that how to do things better, and we will incorporate that uh, as we move forward into the new plans. Yes, sir. It's clear from the, the record-breaking case count today and hospitalizations that people are not acting on the CDC guidance right now or have not been. How much longer can the state wait for people to behave themselves before you step in and tighten restrictions to limit community spread? Yeah, you, you know, um, that's a great question, and, and I'm not prepared to answer it today. I'll have to answer it t next week, right? Because I have a proclamation that expires a week from today. Um, but it sort of begs the question, and, and, and this is a different um, application of something that I said starting back in March, and I've been saying it all the way through. We are not going to enforce our way out of this. Either the people of Louisiana are going to sufficiently embrace these measures, or they're not. And if they're not following mitigation measures and restrictions that are in place, what makes you believe that if I impose more restrictions and mitigation measures that they're going to follow those? And this is the dilemma for me as governor right now. The status quo is unacceptable. And if I've been unable to articulate that to the people of Louisiana sufficiently, I apologize. If my command of the English language is not good enough to communicate that sufficiently, I apologize. We have to do better. Are we going to do better if, if, I mean, what are we going to do? Start locking people up if they insist on not wearing a mask when they should? These social gatherings around Christmas, I mean, how many police officers do we have? We're going to post somebody at everybody's home? We are not going to enforce our way out of this, people. We're either going to do the right thing or we're not. And if we don't do better, we're going to watch a lot more of our fellow Louisiana brothers and sisters die. It is really that simple. Now, while it's simple, it's not easy. And I can tell you, I will be considering everything that might make sense between now and next Tuesday. But I'm encouraging the people to do what they can right now. There is nobody in our state who can say, honestly, I wasn't told, I didn't know. Who's going to say that? They may say, I didn't believe it was that serious. The hospital is full of people who didn't believe it was that serious. Go ask them. We have families grieving today because they didn't do what was required to protect their loved ones, because they didn't take it seriously. Go ask them. Don't take my word for it. It's happening all over the state and all over the country. All right. We've been here for about an hour. I want to thank you all for continuing to cover this. We clearly have work to do. We have to slow the transmission of this disease. We have to protect one another. We have to administer the vaccine in ever-increasing numbers across a broader portion of our population. None of this is going to be easy and none of this is going to be overnight. But we have something to look forward to. And that is, if we do the best we can in a few months, 
several months, we will have enough people vaccinated to where we can finally start to put this pandemic in our rearview mirror. But between now and then, for God's sake, understand that the vaccine isn't gonna get us out of these immediate problems that we're in. We can only do that by distancing from one another, by staying home when we're sick, by wearing our mask, washing our hands frequently, protecting the vulnerable among us. And, and look, there, there's some things that we haven't talked about in a while, but they didn't stop being true. It, any event outside is safer than that same event inside. I want you to support your restaurants, but take the food home and eat it. Go through the drive through have it delivered. Always safer than eating in the restaurant. If you are 65 and older, or you have one of these comorbid health conditions that predisposes you to a poor outcome should you contract the disease, don't go anywhere in any room where anybody doesn't have a mask on. I mean, these are things that we've been talking about all along. They, they still remain true. They still remain very, very important. So I'm asking the folks to do better. And let's pray for one another. Let's lift one another up. Let's be good neighbors. This is the challenge for this generation. This happens every hundred years. Th th this is our moment. Are we going to rise to the challenge and do what's required? Or are we just going to say, well, you know, I'm tired of that. That's just too much of a bother to put that mask on. I'm going to choose to believe what I read on the Internet. I'm not going to follow the U.S. Surgeon General or Dr. Redfield who runs the CDC or Dr. Fauci or Dr. Burks. I'm just going to choose to believe this information that happens to be convenient because if I believe it, it sort of justifies me not doing anything. And I understand that that's a psychological coping me mechanism, but it's not a good way to behave during a pandemic. So let's do better. Let's pray for one another. Let's lift one another up. Let's encourage one another. And let's get through this together with God's help. Thank you all.